get the briefing underway and have a quick discussion about some of the key points and drivers of the markets this morning. Uh, one thing I'll say now is that I'll do a full French specific preview uh, a bit later on this afternoon, which I will record and make available to everyone. So um, I'm not going to talk about the French elections too much in this particular briefing because we'll, we'll go into much greater depth later. But having a look at the, the charts this morning, uh, I think you've really got to pick up things from where European markets closed yesterday because uh, just bringing up the S&P, we had a pretty quiet day overall through our morning uh, and then really it was when Europe left when the US equity market really started to, to liven up on the upside, breaking above uh, that high print from the prior day. Uh, pretty sharp move seen across the major three indices in the US, uh, which was supported by some fundamental changes. And that being, if you remember, um, a little bit of the sell-off that we had on the prior day was about the fact of, you know, is the market starting to get a little bit fatigued by this element of, you know, Trump implementation risk actually being realized uh, following on from the repeal of Obamacare failing and so on and so forth, the comments from the Treasury Sec Secretary at the weekend in that FT article talking about trying to push back the timelines of you know, when he's going to deliver on these tax reforms and so on and so forth. Well, the same guy who made those comments did an about turn almost as good as Trump himself. And now Stephen Muchin is saying that tax overhaul plan will happen by the end of the year. Uh, specifically, the Trump administration is aiming to complete the biggest overhaul of the tax code since um, Reagan by the end of the year, even if a second attempt to repeal the Affordable Care Act fails. So <laughs> after saying, prepping the market that this might not happen, it's now just spun on its head. Uh, so this created then almost a short term move back to you know, kind of mini Trump trade again, the dollar strengthened, equities picked up. Um, so as you can see with euro dollar in top left on my screens, we had that slight downtick seen yesterday evening as the dollar re-strengthened on the back of this. It wasn't just this, there was also a couple of noises from various US politicians talking about bringing the healthcare bill as soon as next week to have it voted on again, i.e. the repeal of Obamacare. That hasn't gone away. Uh, some of the Republicans still looking to push that through. And so that in combination with this kind of emphasis that they can get the job done on t tax overhaul. Then also I did see comments around a similar sort of time uh, yesterday where one of the Fed, Federal Reserve members, <coughs> excuse me, Jerome Powell, was commenting saying the Fed could ease the regulatory burden that it puts on boards of directors of banks. Powell saying the possible changes would be aimed at allowing boards of directors to focus on banking strategy rather than the overly detailed checklist of supervisory process requirements. You know, you talk about this watering down of financials regulation. You know, this is the Fed member now talking about it, not the administration. So all of these things are pro-US equity, hence the reason why we moved fairly aggressively yesterday. Fed talking about deregulating of the market to a certain extent on this specific point. You've got Muchin talking about getting the tax overhaul done irrespective of what happens on the healthcare bill. And then finally you've got some movement on the healthcare bill. Still seems to be a bit up in the air, but possibly that could come about a vote in the near term as well to get that repeal done and dusted. So it's almost as if Trump back on track again as far as uh, the reaction that we saw yesterday and hence we've had that positive move and close in on Wall Street. Uh, that did translate into a positive session for Asia. It basically took the baton uh, and followed suit. You've also had a little bit of attention news-wise to this chap, uh, Kuroda, who's the head of the Bank of Japan, if you don't realize who he is for some of the newer guys. So the topics, which is kind of the, one of the main composite Asian indices, uh, for equity markets jumped as he basically reiterated the head of Bank of Japan that sees accommodative policy continuing. 
Uh, I wouldn't say that was the sole catalyst for it. Overnight, you had some positive Japanese data. You also had iron ore, which we'd been looking at earlier. We had been looking at earlier in the week because iron ore had been tumbling. It now has rebounded for a third consecutive day. So like with any kind of severe movement in an asset like you've had in iron ore over a couple of weeks to the downside, there comes a point of some natural kind of profit taking on that move. Uh, and maybe possibly that's what's occurring. Uh, in light as well of these probably supportive, more macro policies from the central banks will help kind of reassure the market that you know, there's nothing to be nervous about. The central banks will help keep a, an accommodative environment. Uh, what it's meant, though, for the yen, I mean, the yen is seeing a little bit of strength as uh, Europe's come in this morning. But generally speaking, it did uh, soften up a touch overnight on the back of some of the comments out of Kuroda. Um, but I'd say nothing really too outright big in those moves overall. Uh, in terms of the risk assets, I mean, dollar yen sitting around pivot. I'd be interested to see whether or not we can make any type of concerted break below there. Uh, but gold is not really moving much at all, pretty much locked around pivot also, which has um, acted as resistance in overnight Asia pack trade. So in terms of getting a gauge of risk sentiment, not a lot of um, telltale signs that are ongoing in those traditional kind of safe haven plays. Uh, the one thing that is seeing a bit of an uptick, though, if you are looking at the commodity markets, obviously with iron ore up for a third consecutive day, uh, positive move in Asian indices overnight so the Aussies looking a little bit firmer uh, having moved beyond pivot through the overnight Asia pack session uh, probably upside then be keeping on those highs that we had uh, from yesterday if we continue that move any higher okay quick look at some other things uh, I said I wasn't going to talk about France much and I won't um, but a few things just to be aware of. Obviously, there was another terror attack on the Champs Elysees yesterday in the centre of Paris, which did come amid actually ongoing televised debate. It was actually happening just a short distance away from the actual um, incident where it occurred in central Paris. Um, the interesting thing here is. The market hasn't moved on that news. I mean, the actual incident itself happened at around uh, shortly after nine o'clock in the evening, I think it was. And so the futures in the FX market didn't really see much reaction. The market's not really taking much notice of that. The sad truth of the matter is, is that the market's kind of desensitized, if you like, to the, uh, the regularity of these terrorist, terrorist attacks, particularly in France. The more interesting longer term play here, obviously, is to do with the fact that roughly a third of voting French people are undecided who they're going to vote for. And naturally, I'd say incidents of this nature play into the hands of the, uh, the far right, so Marine Le Pen. And no surprises, the head of the, the National Front is going to be speaking in 15 minutes time, holding a press conference. This is kind of strategic play, I'd say. They've already all commented because they all spoke during the live televised debate last night. But Le Marine Le Pen obviously wants to take advantage of the news that's happened and what's occurred to really ram home her point about regaining sovereignty, having greater border control and immigration, and so on and so forth. And obviously striking while the iron's hot going into the actual voting day on Sunday. Um, again, we'll talk about this a lot more later, but looking at the polls, it's very much a similar reflection from what you've already seen in the prior days gone by. Uh, the televised debate, obviously at this late in the game, no one's really going to be risking too much, so it's kind of the status quo. No one really triumphed or failed, I would say, uh, in that session that was last night. Uh, the one thing that is interesting, though, and Deutsche Bank were highlighting this morning, was that if you look at the last three polls run by some of the most influential pollsters, the spread between the top four candidates is about four and a half percentage points, which basically means that it's within the margin of error from previous elections. So to say that this is an outright runaway Macron-Le Pen are going to go through, I think is a bit of a false pretense. 
uh, looking at it on a more kind of statistical basis. So definitely it's a four-way race here, um, and we'll look at that in more, more depth later. Other things that I've seen this morning, just to get you up to speed, I had a lot of questions when we saw that. Well, let's look back at the oil chart that we had with that move, uh, not yesterday, but the day before when we had the oil infantry numbers. So this was Wednesday. We had this dramatic collapse in prices. And it wasn't as if this was just on the infantry report. A lot of people were asking me, you know, why did we fall so sharply? Uh, and I was talking at the time about, you know, a few things where, you know, as much as I can sit here and try to explain and give reasons why the market is moving like that, uh, a lot of the time it's momentum, technical levels being breached, um, algos hitting the move, uh, it almost snowballs into a much bigger move than potentially it might have been, liquidity might be an issue, you know, there's, there's kind of the order flow of things can often be the main contributor to these moves rather than anything really outright fundamental. You know, it's not always down to just a specific piece of news, but obviously that can act as a catalyst. Goldman Sachs then this morning really kind of talking about that in regards to um, the move earlier this week they were talking about wasn't so much um, to do with the fundamentals at that time. They were looking at the fact that it was a technical drop um, the 150 day moving averages being breached obviously these things help the downside pick up some momentum and so on and so forth um, but Goldman's like I think it's City are two of the banks that do foresee um, prices by I think it's uh, mid-year or in the coming months they see it going to $60 a barrel $60 a barrel, I'd say, is at the more punchy end of optimism of where prices are going to go in terms of the forecasts on Wall Street. Now, their argument is that basically OPEC and non-OPEC will continue to step into the market and will continue to prop things up by further extensions to the production cuts. That's basically the premise of what they're, what they're looking at. And that as we go further through time, the more that the oversupply in the market will get eradicated to the point where the production cuts will start to become more effective later on down the line. That's kind of the view that they're taking. Um, so looking at oil this morning though, there certainly is an interesting level coming up just to keep an eye on in the context of the kind of the weekly move so to speak. Uh, so that big push lower on Wednesday, we did test it pretty much to the, to the tick late yesterday and we're coming down within a 10 cent range of that at the moment so 50 51 you've then got s1 on the daily pivots at 50 36 then obviously psychologically the big handle at 50 uh, to be aware of if you go down to the 50 mark well if you look at that s1 on the daily pivots that also is around those low points that were seen either side of the you know, we're looking at end of March and beginning of April as well. So some decent technical levels of support to be aware of. And obviously, from a fundamental perspective, as I said yesterday, the lower this price goes, the more vocal OPEC will become in terms of snap headlines on the, on the news wires. So a, the possibility of very volatile price action, the lower bound of this recent range we get, or the higher the risk is that someone could say something to knock you out of a position. So, you know, just worth keeping that in mind with your strategies with trading oil. Um, with OPEC and their cuts, I did see just quickly some interesting graphics that summarize the situation. I did send these out to you this morning. This is basically an update as toward the OPEC cuts and where we are in terms of the implementation of the agreement. And actually, the, obviously, the big surprising factor when we rallied really a few months ago was on the back of the, um, the actual compliance that they followed for the first time really ever. really does show, or it speaks volumes, I think, for how desperate OPEC are in order to keep this price propped up and the pain that they're feeling as a collective group because they're overstepping the mark at the moment. They're up at 104%. And the interesting thing here is who is actually doing it. 
because if you look at the OPEC nations, they're all committed to a very high degree in going above and beyond, whereas the non-OPEC nations are less committed. And obviously that does include the Russians. You know, they have increased from kind of 50 percentage points to 66, but they're still way off where they should be. And so it's kind of almost a reluctant agreement, if you like, from those parties. Now, looking at the ones that have been already uh, reaching their target, obviously it's driven by the main dominating partner of OPEC, Saudi Arabia. Uh, but we've got others also starting to follow in suit. Obviously, Angola and Venezuela, two countries that are very much feeling the squeeze fiscally on the back of such a low price for them in order to balance their budget. In terms of overall individual countries, this is quite a good graphic just to show the black box is the actual quota in which they must cut as part of the agreement defined by OPEC back in end of November. And that's the agreement amount. So they've got to cut by 486 Saudi Arabia. The bigger number is the amount they're actually cutting by. So Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Venezuela, Angola, Qatar, uh, Azerbaijan, Mexico, Sudan, Brunei, they're all doing more than they need to. The Russians are about halfway. So they're still not completely committed, which is obviously a, a real key here, given the capacity of the size of production that they produce on a daily basis. Other notable names, obviously the likes of Iraq, UAE, these are big level producers within OPEC as well. So they still need to, you know, kind of pull their weight in that respect. Um, just quickly back to the charts. Uh, DAX has moved a little higher this morning. Euro dollar, you can see top left here, just pulling back off pivot a little bit, but initial move higher this morning. You have had some economic data come out. You've had the French and German respective manufacturing service PMIs. Uh, the French one in particular, exceptionally strong on the manufacturing side. Um, so France business activity has hit a fresh six year high in April pointing to surprising economic strength in, strength in the Eurozone's second largest economy, certainly as we head into these polls, still remaining very confident in those particular economic activities from a business level. Uh, growth in German business activity has eased, but does remain strong in terms of the data we've seen out of them, with Eurozone to follow shortly at 9 o'clock. So that's probably what's just helped a little bit here. Um, one final story, just to have a quick look at, because I did get the question put my way, was about Deutsche Bank because there was some headline news last night where Deutsche Bank is the first bank busted for breaking the Volcker rule. Uh, so basically Deutsche Bank, um, they've been hit by the Fed with a fine. Um, essentially what's happened here is a little bit like LIBOR where their currency desks were chatting online with competitors and allegedly revealing their positions. Obviously this is now deemed as a regulatory breach this is kind of like what I've told to you guys before. The predominant use of Bloomberg systems is for the IB chat and in LIBOR where they were revealing positions with each other to, to benefit um, each other or help each other out from time to time in order to get better prices. Seemingly, this is still ongoing uh, and they've been caught for it. Uh, the fine that the Fed, is, Fed has levied is $157 million. $157 million in a litigation fine for an investment bank is absolutely tiny. I know it sounds like a lot of money, but these, some of these banks, in terms of uh, some of the other, you know, PPI mis-selling, the subprime fallout cri of the, the crisis and so on, they've been fined multi-billions, getting close to double digit. That's kind of the upper realm of big fines. If you remember Deutsche Bank, when they were getting hit below 10 euros, I think this was back in, what, September of last year, the initial fine that the US wanted to put onto Deutsche Bank was up in excess of 14 billion. Obviously, it, was, it, you know, it got settled much lower than that, but $157 million is a real drop in the ocean. Uh, obviously, Deutsche it doesn't condone that that activity should be happening. It shouldn't. Uh, but what I'm saying, the bottom line, this is not going to have an impact on the markets today. 
Okay, calendar-wise, you've had kind of the bulk of the main data from this morning then, that's already done, dusted. We'll look out for the Eurozone numbers to come out for the PMI readings, but remember, this is just generally a composite of the countries already seen, so it's unlikely to impact the marketplace. Later on this morning, actually, you do have an interesting number for sterling traders. You've got UK retail sales. Now, retail sales, well, actually, let's just quickly bring up, bring up retail sales because this is obviously a very important indicator for Britain, given the fact that inflation has been rising and is that impeding the ability for the UK consumer to spend? This is a big question mark, given we are a service-driven economy. So the last three months have been a little bit erratic. We had a very weak reading in the Christmas period, only to then recover to broadly flat in New Year, to then go back positive to 1.4%, which was stronger than expected last month. Uh, this will be an interesting number to have a look out for in the pound at half past nine. Uh, otherwise, looking back on the calendar, that's pretty much it for the morning. You've got Bank of England member Saunders is speaking with text at a small business uh, federation conference at 12.45. So again, sterling traders, I'll keep an eye on that. Uh, in the afternoon, you get the respective market manufacturing and service PMIs for the US, uh, existing home sales, neither of which I think is going to be too impactful. I think the broader things to look out for for the US is any more commentary out of Trump and the administration because they seem to be flip-flopping with their view on a number of these tax issues and the healthcare reform and so on and so forth, which does have the propensity, as seen yesterday, to move the equity market quite quickly. Uh, overall, though, one final word um, of overall approaching today's session, and I've had a quick chat with the live guys already this morning, is that you're about to head into uh, a very big event on the weekend, that being the French elections, results of which we'll see Sunday night for the reopening of trade Sunday night and then into Monday morning when Europe comes back in. As such, even though the baseline scenario is that Macron will go through with Le Pen, which all being equal will probably be received with a warm relief rally in the markets, albeit no matter how small that might be, there is a big tail risk here that it could be that Filon and Macron do not even qualify and that would be the worst case scenario uh, as those reasons we've discussed before about the negative stance on the EU that both Le Pen and Mélenchon have. So even though that's a very small probability, it carries a huge risk no matter how small. That means then from a larger institutional size order flow, that's very unlikely to be present in the market this close. Guys with bigger size are unlikely to be entering the market at this given point when you'd want the clarity to materialize from what happens over the weekend. So as such, I think a little degree of, uh, I guess, conservatism might be warranted in a day like today. One of the main things as well for the guys um, who are trading live, the worst possible case could be that you do something today, you get caught in a, in a trade that doesn't work, where you've jumped in and been overly aggressive, and it means that you get sin binned on possibly what could be one of the biggest trading days of the year on Monday. And so don't put yourself in that position unless, of course, something happens today. Anything can happen, and if it does, obviously you need to take it. So. I'm not aiming this at anyone in particular, but just you know something to bear in mind. As I say, I will come on later on this afternoon, we'll do a full thorough rundown of the <laughs> French situation, and uh, we'll talk about trade scenarios and how the market might react under different, uh, different candidates going through and so on and so forth. But otherwise, I'll leave you with it. I'll see you in the chat room, and if I don't speak to you before then, have a good weekend.